we're allowing we're allowing people to filter in now. Um, so as people are coming in, I would like to um, formally introduce uh, Dr. Timothy Wang. Um, Dr. Wang is a leading expert in gastroenterology, cancer research, and patient care at Columbia University. He received his MD from Columbia, followed by clinical training at Washington University and Harvard MGH. He was on the Harvard faculty for 11 years and was associate chief of GI at MGH prior to relocation to the University of Massachusetts in 2000, and then returned to Columbia in 2004 as division chief. His main interest has been studying the role of inflammation in both modulating stem cells and in promoting gastrointestinal neoplasia using mouse models. He has won many accolades throughout his career, including the AGA Funderburg Gastric Cancer Award. He's also the editor of the first textbook on gastric cancer. Dr. Wang currently serves as the chair of the GCMB NIH study section, chair of the AGA Future Trends Committee, associate editor for gastroenterology and editor in chief of therapeutic advances in gastroenterology. He is the author of more than 160 original peer reviewed publications and has over 32,000 citations. Please give him a warm welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Dodi, and uh, good afternoon. Um, I think it's a little bit afternoon in uh, California. And thanks for the kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to speak at this Winter Cancer Biology uh, series. And I'll be speaking on the role of inflammation in nerves in the pathogenesis of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, and then with some recent work on the acinar origins of pancreatic cancer. So I'll start with a, just a few comments on chronic inflammation and cancer. Our lab has worked in this area for several decades, and as gastroenterologists, it's clear that inflammation promotes and may even be necessary for most types of GI cancer, although in each case, the inflammatory condition is a bit different. But starting from the top, chronic reflux esophagitis um, leads to Barrett's esophagus and esophageal adenocarcinoma. H. pylori infection is the major cause of chronic atrophic gastritis and promotes stomach cancer. Um, IBD or ulcerative colitis and or colonic dysbiosis uh, can lead to colorectal cancer. Chronic hepatitis, whether due to viral origins or due to NAFLD, uh, can lead to hepatocellular ca uh, carcinoma or HCC. Um, a minor uh, cancer really in some ways, inflammation of the bile ducts from sclerosis and cholangitis or liver fluke inf infection can lead to cholangiocarcinoma. And finally, um, the organ of interest today, uh, the pancreas, chronic pancreatitis, is a major risk factor that predisposes to pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. Now, chronic inflammation is a secret killer, but exactly how it leads to cancer has been for many years a big mystery uh, with some recent progress, however, um, and is studied now by many laboratories. But some of the features of inflammation that we need to consider include the fact that it increases tissue turnover or cellular destruction. Um, and uh, I will uh, argue perhaps that um, the loss of acinar cells in the pancreas is one of the major things that drives proliferation and can lead to mutations. There's recruitment of pro-tumorigenic inflammatory cells, primarily myeloid cells, but also lymphocytes. And as we'll hear from other laboratories, oxidative stress or increase in ROS is a major factor that leads, I think, to pancreatic cancer. Now, these inflammatory cells lead to remodeling of other stromal cell types. Uh, the tumor microenvironment, and uh, all can alter fibroblasts, um, endothelial cells, nerves, matrix proteins, and the microbiome. Uh, chronic inflammation leads to eventually to the emergence of immunosuppressive immune cells, including um, MDSCs, Tregs, immunosuppressive macrophages, and I'll mention in uh, one of my little vignettes, uh, regulatory B cells. Finally, the effects of chronic inflammation um, can lead to epigenetic reprogramming of epithelial progenitors, which then expand and give rise or lead to the emergence of cancer stem cells. However, in this talk, I'm primarily going to focus on the pancreas. And I'll try to, uh, and my laboratory has for many years been trying to model pancreatic cancer and understand its origins. Um, but it's become clear that chronic pancreatitis is, in fact, one of the strongest risk factors for pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. But interestingly, KRAS mutation alone appears insufficient to induce pancreatic cancer, which then is markedly accelerated by inflammation and pancreatitis. Um, 
When we and others try to induce KRAS mutation, G12D in the exocrine pancreas, very little happens in the adult pancreas with no immediate obvious change. But then we do see very slow pattern progression and rare progression to pancreatic cancer. But with the development of, of inflammation of pancreatitis, um, which we can induce by injections of cerulean, which is, uh, and as many of you know, a frog form of cholecystokinin, or pancreatic duct ligation, or IL-1 beta overexpression, a model that I'll describe, they all induce a progenitor-like state, which becomes more receptive to KRAS oncogenic signaling. So a recent work has suggested that, that it is a combination of KRAS mutation and inflammatory injury that results in this sort of epigenetic reprogramming and this acinar to ductal uh, neoplasia switch. And I'll cite just here the um, publication from uh, Scott Lowe's group, Al Alonzo uh, Carvello, but I'll talk a little bit more, more detail about our recent work by our MD Anderson collaborators um, on epithelial uh, memory. So um, in terms of uh, models of pancreatic cancer, I'll start first with one of the models that we generated a while back, which is overexpression of interleukin-1-beta. Um, and this has been one of our, our, our interests for a long time. Interleukin-1-beta is um, uh, a pro-inflammatory cytokine uh, linked over 20 years ago to gastric cancer. It's primarily produced by macrophages and is part of the well-known inflammasome. But IL-1-beta is both upstream and downstream of nf kappa b signaling, and is shown to be increased um, in mouse models of pancreatic cancer is shown by our group, uh, shown here in the top right, where it's increased in KC mice, which have a KRAS mutation alone, but markedly increased in KPC mice that have KRAS plus P53 and really develop full-blown pancreatic cancer. Um, and it's also expressed in, in uh, overexpressed in human pancreatic cancer and is associated with a worse prognosis, as shown in this sort of middle panel here, where patients who have high levels of IL-1 beta tend to die more quickly uh, shown here in, uh, in, uh, in red, compared to low levels of IL-1 beta, which uh, patients live much longer. But it's also the most upregulated cytokine in our model of cerulean-induced pancreatitis. So um, because of these links, we went on to generate transgenic mice overexpressing interleukin-1 beta in the pancreas using as a promoter the elastase promoter and generated these EL-IL-1 beta mice. And uh, this was done uh, now more than 14 years ago by Frederick Marash, and as shown here on the right, elastase IL-1 beta mice show severe pancreatitis with um, significant loss of acinar tissue and marked fibrosis. Um, but nevertheless, these mice, even with um, prolonged aging, did not develop cancer. And even when we um, treated these mice with uh, a variety of carcinogens and nitrosamines, still they did not progress to pancreatic cancer, again, indicating that in the absence of a KRAS mutation, um, pancreatic cancer is very hard to develop in, in mouse models. Thus, to test the effects of IL-1-beta overexpression on cancer development, we then cross these el i one beta mice to the KC mice generated years ago by Hingarani and Tuvison. And these KC mice, just for clarification, are these pdx one Cree LSL KRAS G12D transgenic mice with um, uh, induction of in the, by the PDX1 promoter in the pancreatic epithelium in embryonic state, leading to KRAS mutation early on in the lifetime of these mice. Now, if you follow KC mice over, say, 15 months, you'll see that there is this very slow progression of panins, these preneoplastic pancreatic cancer lesions in the KC mice. Um, but in contrast, in the KC IL-1 beta mice, there is very rapid panin progression an adenocarcinoma developed in nearly half the mice, as shown here in the bottom, by one year, with all of the mice succumbing by a year and a half. Um, so these mice lived um, a bit longer than the KPC mice, um, uh, but not as long, nearly as long as the KC mice, 80% of which survived for 20 months. So the pancreatic tumors, as shown here in the top right, were poorly differentiated, um, and half of the KC alawin beta mice uh, also exhibited liver metastasis as shown here by these gross and histopathologic pathologic, uh, images. So what is the mechanism by which IL-1 beta can induce or, or promote um, pancreatic cancer in KRAS mutant mice? So in terms of mechanisms, we did note a marked increase in epithelial proliferation in the KC IL-1 beta mice, as shown here with more than double um, the uh, number of KI67 positive cells for high power field. In addition, we were able to show that um, IL-1-beta could directly stimulate the growth of pancreatic spheroids 
from wild type pancreas uh, uh, cells, which could be blocked um, by the IL-1 receptor antagonists. We also showed that um, IL-1 beta could increase both apoptosis and ENT. So in addition to its other effects, IL-1 beta can directly stimulate pancreatic progenitors and the exocrine pancreas, although we did not examine and probably should have the direct effects on epigenetic alterations in these cells, something we need to go back and do at some point. However, the development of pancreatic cancer is often associated with a shift towards a more immunosuppressive microenvironment. And so, for, so we looked for changes with IL-1 beta overexpression and the abundance of various immune cells, including lymphocytes, both CD4 and CD8 T cells, as well as B cells, macrophages, um, myelodrive suppressor cells, which are primarily granulocytic, and dendritic cells. And as you can see, most of these immune cells were increased in the KC IL-1 beta mice. And the increases are all these yellow bars shown here, um, except perhaps for dendritic cells, which are not increased. But um, the greatest increase was actually seen in B lymphocytes, which was uh, to some extent a surprise to us. And we confirmed this finding by immunostaining for B220, as shown here, showing increased staining in the KC IL-1 beta pancreas. In addition, we also noticed an increased number of uh, B lymphocytes in the blood or circulation in KC IL-1 beta mice compared to KC mice. Finally, we analyzed the type of B cells uh, that were increased and found that the biggest increase, which was a more than 20-fold increase, was seen in regulatory B cells that were marked by CD19, CD5, and CD1D. We also showed a marked increase in the expression of PDL1 more than 20-fold by these uh, B cells. Now, these B cells from the KCL1 beta mice were able in co-culture to simulate the growth of pancreatic spheres from KRAS mutant mice in a dose-dependent manner shown here um, with increases both in sphere number, as shown here, as well as in sphere size. In addition, we showed that um, CD19 positive uh, B cells from the KCL1 beta mice could suppress uh, CD8 T cells in this LA spot assay in a dose dependent fashion. So here we're sort of incubating um, uh, the CD19 positive B cells with the CD8 T cells and then looking for uh, uh, this, this LA spot, which marks, marks in, uh, interferon gamma. Um, and what we showed here was that in the KCL1 beta mice, um, uh, which are shown in blue, uh, inhibited um, the number of spots, the control is shown here in white. Uh, more than um, uh, B cells from KC mice, which, out, which lack IL-1 beta stimulation. So you can see at almost every dose, um, the blue line is less than the green line, indicating the greater suppressive effect of the B cells from KC IL-1 beta mice. Now we showed a more direct role for B cells in KC IL-1 beta mice in promoting pancreatic cancer through adoptive transfer studies. So here we isolated B cells from either wild type or KCL1 beta mice um, at 12 weeks of age and performed adoptive transfer into KC mice by IP uh, intraperineal injections of 3,000 um, B cells um, at 10 weeks, 13 weeks, and 16 weeks. And then mice were analyzed at 20 weeks. And this is sort of an early time point. And the primary endpoint here was uh, basically the amount of panin or panin area. So mice that received B cells from KCL1 beta, beta mice showed a significant increase in panin area compared to KC mice that received um, B cells from wild type mice um, uh, or compared to untreated KC mice. Um, interesting, as you can see, the wild type B cells had really no effect, overall effect on panin area. In addition, there was a greater than threefold increase in the number of panin three lesions. This is sort of like high grade dysplasia, almost cancer after B cell transfer from the KCL1 beta mice compared to wild type B cells. Uh, and these mice had mostly panin-1 and panin-2 lesions. Thus, it's clear that B cells from KCL1 beta mice have a more tumor-promoting effect than wild-type B cells. Now, um, to show that uh, B cells are actually necessary for pancreatic tumor genesis in these KCL1 beta mice, we depleted B cells using weekly injections of a combination of uh, four different antibodies, antibodies to CD19, B220, CD22, and C20, and we started a treatment with the antibiotic cocktail at 12 weeks and continued it until 20 weeks, at which time the mice were sacrificed. And the deletion of the B cells was confirmed by fax analysis of blood, showing here that there's really no B cells in the, with mice that received the depleted antibodies. 
and also by immunohistochemistry um, of pancreatic tissue. Um, histologic analysis revealed, as you can see here, comparing the control immunoglobulin versus depleted antibodies, that there's greater preservation of acinar tissue and significant smaller amount of these duct-like panin lesions uh, in mice treated with the antibodies compared to the control immunoglobulins. And this is quantified in the bottom right. So these findings confirm a major role for B cells in pancreatic cancer progression in the KCI1 beta mass. So now I'll move on to the uh, second part of my topic, uh, talk, which is really relates also to, to chronic inflammation, but this is now gonna focus on the role of nerves in cancer. Now, cancer alters the nervous system, both the central and peripheral nervous systems. And the nervous system we now recognize plays a central role in cancer pathogenesis. So we and others have been promoting this sort of new area of cancer neuroscience and the idea that there's reciprocal signaling between tumor cells and nerves. And we now view the nerves, at least in our laboratory, as part of the cancer niche, an important part of the cancer niche that contributes to tumor growth. And there have been a number of preclinical and some clinical studies that have suggested promising anti-tumor effects uh, from targeting uh, tumor hyperinnovation. Um, Pioneering uh, studies uh, from the late Paul Frenet really showed roles for both sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves, particularly in the development of prostate cancer. And we entered this area early on in the area of stomach cancer, where we showed a role for parasympathetic nerves and cholinergic signaling with NGF crosstalk in gastric cancer. And finally, the most, sort of most interesting work may be the work from Michelle Manji and others who've showed that gliomas, a brain tumor, has actually become electrically integrated in the normal brain and respond to glutamatergic uh, input and signaling. So we've been asking the question, you know, what is the role then of nerves in pancreatic cancer? So pancreatic cancer um, uh, it uses the same sort of nerves that the normal pancreas does. And the normal pancreas receives innervation from sympathetic, parasympathetic, and sensory nerves. Now in pancreatic cancer, you can see um, increased neural density, marked neural hypertrophy, and high rates of perineural innovation, um, suggesting um, uh, that there is a sort of crosstalk or interaction between nerves and cancer. Now, nerves can act directly on cancer cells, um, providing uh, neurotransmitter signals directly to the uh, uh, transformed epithelial cells, or they could act indirectly on stromal cells, which then modulate uh, tumor growth. So, um, Previous studies established roles for sensory nerves in particular, um, which are perhaps the most abundant nerves entering most um, GI organs. Um, and they did this through sensory denervation um, uh, using ablation of trip V1 uh, fibers using um, either neonatal capsaicin in one study from Solomon and others, um, and or the treatment with this uh, ricinoferitoxin uh, which has the same sort of effect. And in both studies, um, this led to decreased pancreatic cancer growth. And in one case, the first study uh, increased survival of the mice. Thus, we asked the question, what are the roles then of sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system in the development of pancreatic cancer? Now, we first addressed the role of the sympathetic nervous system using this model of chronic restraint stress. And so in this model, mice are restrained by typically putting them into a a small tube of some sort for an hour or so. Um, and what we were able to show in this sort of uh, model is that leads to a, a significant activation of sympathetic signaling and actually leads to increased uh, circulating levels of epinephrine, uh, the major um, catecholamine release from the adrenal glands. And the increase is, is around or slightly more than, than really twofold. Um, so we enrolled uh, these KRAS mutant mice, the so-called KC mice, into a chronic restraint stress protocol, listed here as CRS, um, starting at around age six to seven weeks and continuing it up until say 20 weeks. And then we then analyzed the pancreas uh, organs and scored the animals in terms of the percent of animals with pancreatic cancer. So overall, as you can see, looking at this bar graph down below compared to the control of KC mice alone, the combination of restraint stress in the KC mice led to a significant acceleration of pancreatic cancer, such that by 20 uh, weeks, 30% of the KC mice had full-blown pancreatic cancer, but again, none of the controls. Now, the mice showed an increased expression of one of the catecholamine receptors, the so-called beta-2 adrenergic receptor, or ADRB2. 
It also led to an increase in nerve number and neural density by peripheral staining. And so to address the role of this particular um, adrenergic receptor, we treated the mice with an ADRB2 blocker, the so-called drug ICI-118551, or uh, we carried out um, a knockout uh, of the ADRB2 receptor, or we actually performed adrenalectomy on the mice, removing the adrenal glands and the source of circulating epinephrine. Now, all three of these treatments shown here, the knockout, the adrenalectomy, and the treatment with the beta-2 uh, drug, all markedly reduce the green bars. You can see the percentage of pancreatic cancer. In contrast, treatment with a broadly active adrenergic um, agonist, isoproteranol, led to a doubling or marked increase in pancreatic cancer. Thus, it's clear from these data that pancreatic cancer is clearly accelerated by stress and beta adrenergic uh, signaling. Now, um, this was in the sort of KC mice, the mice that tend to develop panins, and we went on to address the role of um, adrenergic uh, signaling in a full-blown model of pancreatic cancer, which was our KPC mice that had KRAS mutation, as well as one mutant P53 gene with the R172H uh, mutation. And uh, so using this model, we first confirmed that the KPC mice indeed showed an increase in nerve number, an increase in nerve density, and specifically an increase in tyrosine hydroxylase or sympathetic nerves uh, in and around the pancreas. We then examined the effect of blocking sympathetic signaling using two approaches. The first was uh, what we call sympathetic ganglia, ganglionectomy, moving sympathetic ganglia near the pancreas, and this is shown in the top right, or a treatment with the uh, beta-2 adrenergic antagonist, ICI-118551, shown in the bottom left. Um, and we looked at these treatments in combination with gemcitabine, uh, the standard chemotherapeutic uh, treatment for pancreatic cancer. And in both cases, um, we enrolled the mice when the tumors were three to four millimeters in size. So we only treated mice that had existing tumors um, and then randomized to, to their treatments, either gemcitabine or gem plus one of the other treatments. So either ganglinectomy plus gem or ICI-118551 plus gem led to a significant increase in survival as shown here, uh, the green line with the, the combination treatment compared to gem alone. Um, and it also led to reduced tumor size or tumor volume as measured by ultrasound. Um, interestingly, treatment uh, with either of these combination treatments, ICI or, or ganglinectomy, led to a, a marked reduction in nerve density, um, which is also a bit surprising since we were blocking uh, not necessarily the nerves themselves, but the receptors on the tumors and other cell types. And this was initially a puzzle to us, but we went on to investigate it further. And just to make the story a bit short, what we found was in fact that there was this crosstalk uh, between um, beta-2 adrenergic signaling and um, expression and secretion of the uh, neurotrophin, NGF or nerve growth factor. And so what we found was that um, um, ADRB2 signaling, um, upregulated CREB, ERK, and then upregulated NGF uh, gene expression uh, in uh, human cells that have regulated uh, BDNF to a greater extent than NGF. And then this upregulation of NGF, which was then secreted, then acted back on the tumor stroma, increasing nerve density um, and also pancreatic tumor genesis. And so we wanted to show that um, uh, pancreatic cancer, KPC mice, could be inhibited not only by beta-2 specific blockers, but also track inhibitors, which prolong survival in the KPC mouse model. Now, uh, in addition to sympathetic um, signaling, um, I wanted, we went, our lab went on to study the role of the parasympathetic or cholinergic nervous system in pancreatic cancer. Now, parasympathetic nerves are carried to the pan pancreas primarily by the posterior branch of the vagus nerve um, through the post, what's called the postgastric branch. And as mentioned earlier, um, the, we had shown that um, the vagus nerve actually promotes gastric tumor genesis, such that a vagotomy um, in this gastric cancer model suppressed stomach tumor growth. So we initially postulated that vagotomy might also suppress pancreatic tumor growth. But um, as we like to find sometimes, um, our, our results were just the opposite of the hypothesis that I initially put forward, which makes it more likely to be true. So we carried out um, vagotomy in these uh, KC mouse model. Um, and again, this is the mouse model with KRAS mutation alone, and found that um, vagotomy led to increased panins and increased pancreatic cancer development. 
And this is shown here in, this, in these bottom two, two panels. So uh, on the left, we show pan and area and vagotomy alone, uh, when compared to the con uh, actually a control operation, which was pyloroplasty, which needs to be done in mice that receive a vagotomy. They also need a pyloroplasty so their stomach can empty. And so this was the control operation. And the vagotomized mice, as you, as you can see, um, had twice the increase in pan and area, uh, but more importantly, had a significant 40% rate of developing pancreatic cancer uh, by five months of age with 0% uh, percent cancer in the control mice. In addition, um, treatment of the vagotomized um, KC mice with a broad muscarinic agonist, which in this case was the drug bethanicol, led to suppression of tumor growth with decreased pan and area, um, along with a much lower incidence of uh, pancreatic cancer. Furthermore, when we, um, the combination of bethanicol plus gemcitabine led to an overall increased survival in our KPC mouse model compared to gemcitabine alone. Lastly, we actually uh, included a metastatic model of pancreatic cancer, the PANCO2 metastatic model, where um, PANCO2 uh, cancer cells that are syngenaic are injected into the spleen of mice, followed by a partial splenectomy. Um, these cells then typically metastasize to the liver, uh, which leads to sort of a rapid uh, demise at around uh, 40, 35 to 40 days of age. In this model, as you can see in the blue, bethanicol led to increased survival, while selective hepatic innervation of the liver led to shorter survival, again, pointing to a major role, a protective role for cholinergic signaling uh, in pancreatic cancer. Now, um, in terms of the receptors mediating this effect, um, botanicol is a very broad, um, uh, a broad uh, muscarinic agonist. And um, so we investigated the relevant muscarinic receptors mediating this anti-tumorigenic effect. And we found that the KC pancreas actually expressed all five muscarinic receptors as shown here, CHRM1 to CHRM5. Um, but in the mice that received vagonomy, only one of the receptors, um, the muscarinic 1 receptor or CHRM1, was significantly upregulated uh, by vagonomy, as shown by PCR, as shown here, and in situ hybridizations, shown on the top right. And the fact that it was upregulated with innervation suggested to us that it was really the major receptor mediating this effect. So we went on to carry out um, knockout of this one muscarinic receptor in the KC background. And knockout of um, M1 receptor uh, led to increased panins and again reproduced the 40% uh, uh, development of pancreatic cancer in the KC mice, mimicking again the effect of vagonomy. Similarly, whole body knockout of CHRM1 in the KPC mouse led to more rapid tumor growth, again, similar uh, in some ways uh, to other previous findings, and led to decreased survival, as shown here in the red, of uh, the KPC mice that had the simultaneous knockout of, of the muscarinic 1 receptor. Um, now, while muscarinic signaling likely has a tumor suppressive effect on both the cancer epithelial cells and the stroma, we initially investigated more uh, the direct effects of awe on cancer cells and found that treatment of PANC1 cells with cholinergic agonists, such as bethanicol or pilocarpine, decrease the number of CD44 positive, CD24 positive, EPCAM positive pancreatic cancer stem cells. Um, uh, and we also observed as, um, as shown here, um, decreased CD44 staining of the KPC pancreas uh, tumor after a combination of gemcitabine plus pathetical treatment. And we also, as not shown in the slide, found a decreased number of PANC1 uh, uh, colony forming units and cancer stem cells tumors as measured by injection into node skid mice. Um, we then measured cancer stem cells uh, directly in KPC mice um, uh, that were treated with gemcitabine plus bethanicol and observed a marked decrease in CD44, CD133 viable cells uh, that are markers of cancer stem cells in this model. Finally, we've also carried out um, pilot studies of bethanicol in patients. Um, and this was a clinical trial in patients that are going to undergo um, Whipple operations, and they received one week of um, bethanicol prior to the surgery, which then has allowed us to um, examine uh, the resected pancreatic specimens um, for a variety of markers, mainly by immunohistochemistry. And as shown here, we observed a possible suppression of CD44 immunostaining 
uh, compared to uh, in this botanical treated patient compared to uh, a, a random control. But overall, this is consistent with the idea of suppression potentially of a cancer stem cell uh, population. Now, we were um, a bit puzzled by the effects of bethanicol, which is a broad muscarinic agonist, on suppressing pancreatic cancer growth. It was surprising in some ways because the vagus is known to normally stimulate pancreatic exocrine growth, and in fact, growth of most of the GI tract. So then we went back and examined the effect of cholinergic stimulation on normal pancreatic exocrine cells from the mouse in comparison to KRAS mutant pan uh, pancreatic cells. And so to, to do this, we used a spheroid assay, a spheroid culture of pancreatic um, exocrine cells from this LSL KRAS mouse that has this set of potential uh, knock-in of the KRAS mutation, but looked at it with and without uh, Cree recombinase. So when the control was untreated, but on the right, you can see adenocree treated um, pancreatic cells where the KRAS mutation is then activated. So we can compare directly the effect of KRAS on the response to a um, muscarinic agonist such as pyloparpine. So what you see in the graph on the right is in the absence of adenocree, um, pyloparpine stimulates um, sphere number per well, suggesting the normal growth effect you would expect. But in the presence of activated KRAS, shown here on the right, pyloparpine then markedly inhibits um, growth of pancreatic spheroids, um, consistent with um, the idea that mutant KRAS somehow converts cholinergic signaling um, from a stimulatory to a suppressive signal. So finally, in terms of other types of downstream signaling, we examine the effect of cholinergic signaling in vivo with bethanicol in both um, uh, murine tissue is shown here, again, comparing vigotomy, um, no vigotomy, and bethanicol treatment, as well as in tissues from our patients, again, treated with bethanicol for one week prior to surgery. So as you can see, we found that vagotomy increases and bethanicol treatment decreases, phospho-EGFR, um, phospho-PI3 kinase, and phospho-ERK in both the mice. And in the human tissue, we see downregulation of phospho-EGFR and phospho-ERK, as well as K67, another uh, uh, biomarker that we've been looking at. Um, uh, and so the, the mouse and the human tissue uh, seems fairly similar. Um, and this has uh, led to sort of uh, an ongoing sort of clinical trial now of uh, bethanicol in, in some of our patients, um, um, uh, a new adjuvant uh, treated uh, who are undergoing surgery. So um, finally, while there are likely direct effects on um, cholinergic signaling in pancreatic cancer cells, as shown by our studies in our data, we've begun to investigate more deeply the effects of cholinergic signaling on immune and stromal cells. And we have noted so far that vagotomy sort of increases um, F40 positive macrophages, again, decreased by bethanicol, and as well as TNF alpha levels in the spleen, again, decreased by bethanicol. Um, we've also observed some interesting increases um, in CXCL12 with knockout of the muscarinic one receptor. And in our patient data, we've observed sort of an interesting increase in CCL5 in um, human PDAC patients. And this is data from four patients after one week of bethanicol treatment. And for this, Studies are ongoing of studying the effects of cholinergic modulation of both the adaptive and immune system, but particularly um, one postdoc in our lab is focusing on the effects on T cells and getting some interesting and sort of positive uh, data there. So now um, uh, in the last third of the talk, I'm going to sort of um, switch gears and talk about the astronaut origins of pancreatic cancer. This slide shows the most common model for genetic and histologic progression to pancreatic cancer described originally by Ralph Rubin and Hopkins through oncogenic mutations in um, uh, KRAS, P16, P53, SMAD4, leading to panins of various stages. And the panins are shown here on the right, panin 1, 2, 3, and, and uh, adenocarcinoma. And this early progression you know, to pancreatic cancer can be achieved in mice through, as shown by many groups, uh, through KRAS mutations targeted to acinar cells and suggesting perhaps that acinar cells are the predominant origin of, of pancreatic cancer through this process of acinar detectable metaplasia. However, it was later shown that pancreatic cancer can also arise um, from pancreatic ductal cells in mice, particularly as in the recent studies have shown using simultaneous KRAS and P53 mutations. However, uh, in addition, there's several pancreatic cancer subtypes have been described. I'll mention only very briefly this work from 
Ken Olive and, and um, Pasquale Lace suggesting three different subtypes now, lineage morphogenic and oncogenic. Um, and this is sort of the, the classification we're using here at Columbia. And there is this hypothesis that perhaps different subtypes of pancreatic cancer may arise from potentially different cells of origin, uh, but that remains to be proven. Now, many studies have demonstrated though that acinar cells can undergo a process called acinar to ductal metaplasia, whereby acinar cells are converted into these duct-like cells that you've seen in some of the histopathology I've shown. And this is known to occur in response to inflammatory injuries, such as you can see this in acute pancreatitis models, but is greatly facilitated by KRAS mutation through hyperactivation of RAS signaling and possibly metabolic stress. And so these ductural-like ADM cells are thought to be the precursors then of pan and, and pancreatic ductular adenocarcinoma. And this is, I think it is an important question as to where ADM comes from, what leads to this process of dedifferentiation or is it transdifferentiation that occurs in these regenerative states? And finally, the question that our laboratory has been most interested in is, is this plasticity a feature of some or most or all acinar cells? Now there's reason um, to believe that acinar cells are actually more heterogeneous than homogeneous. Now, acinar cells under the microscope appear to be morphologically indistinguishable, but there are in fact known regional differences in their production, the production of digestive enzymes, in gene expression, and in susceptibility to neoplasia. Um, functionally, um, our model, the one that we've been sort of developing, I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, later, is one of both facultative or quiescent progenitors that are more slowly dividing, as well as more active, they can call them transit amplifying or progenitors, TAP or actively dividing progenitors have been described. Um, now, several groups have undertaken single cell sequencing, certainly of both the normal pancreas as well as pancreatic cancer. But in the normal pancreas, it's shown the presence of a distinct acinar subpopulations. And I'll just cite this most recent study by Tostidol that suggested three acinar subpopulations, acinar reg cells, um, secretory acinar cells, and so-called idling acinar cells. Now these idling acinar cells had low levels of digestive enzymes, suggesting they're less differentiated, more responsive to external stimuli. And um, in pseudotime in trajectory analysis suggested this cell time, this cell type uh, actually possessed a greater degree of plasticity. Now our interest in these idling uh, acinar cells resulted from our studies of the gene <clears throat> double cortin like kinase one or DCLK1, which is a, a C-terminal serin kinase known to be expressed in neural progenitors and epithelial tough cells. And when we study these cells in the pancreas, we did this by generating DCLK1 CRE-ERT back transgenic mice. We crossed them to reporter mice. And we found that it marked rare 0.2% of all the epithelial cells, um, cells in the pancreas. And they were all Ki67 negative, but very long lived. They lived 18 to 24 months of the lifetime of the mouse. But they showed significant um, sphere forming ability and showed limited expansion under conditions of normal homeostasis. So as shown here at three months, you could see it goes from a single cell maybe to little clusters of cells, but not much of a, a tremendous expansion. However, in response to inflammatory injury, such as bile duct ligation uh, um, um, or pancreatic, a, par a partial pancreatectomy is shown here, and we achieved similar results with radiation injury and cerulean uh, induced pancreatitis models, we could see um, tremendous expansion uh, of this lineage, lineage tracing of, of much or most of the regenerating pancreas. Um, now, when we cross these DCLK CRE-RT mice to LSLK RAS G12D mice, we observed the development, as many have in other models, of slow development of panins. But in the setting of inflammation, that is treatment with cerulean pancreatitis, we saw rapid progression to advanced panins and even pancreatic cancer, despite this very, very small 0.2% um, number of cells initially targeted. And this does suggest to us that these DCLK cells that were very slowly dividing were facultative progenitor cells that can be activated by inflammatory injury and that can serve as um, potent cancer initiating cells. Now, um, if they are sort of important facultative progenitors or reserve progenitors, 
um, that are there for response to injury. We asked the question as to whether they are actually critical for pancreatic regeneration following inflammatory injury. And this was tested by carrying out what we call um, diphtheria toxin ablation studies. And there's several ways to do this. In this model, we crossed our DCLK ERT mice to ROSA26 diphtheria toxin A expressing mice. So with treatment with tamoxifen, this would induce expression of diphtheria toxin A, which um, uh, is uh, toxic to humans, but in mice, they lack the receptor, uh, uh, but expressing it intracellularly can induce um, uh, a, a, a severe uh, cellular death and necrosis. So we crossed these mice um, and at baseline when we gave tamoxifen, it had really um, no effect on the mice. However, we then examined the effect of DT ablation of DCLK1 cells in a, a chronic in a pancreatitis model. And so uh, the model was uh, treatment with cerulean, um, seven hourly injections with this CCK-like peptide on two consecutive days and then um, analysis at, at day nine uh, or seven, uh, uh, day nine. So as you can see in normal wild type mice, it doesn't really kill them. This is shown in blue. It does result in um, uh, severe pancreatitis, severe inflammation and marked acinar cell loss. But the mice showed significant recovery with injury significantly restored by day nine with by then normal body weight, uh, no mortality, uh, but it does result in this slightly edematous uh, pancreas, which resolves over the next several weeks. In contrast, when we ablated DCLK cells by tamoxifen prior to the uh, treatment with cerulean, what we saw was, was much worse. Um, um, worse pancreatitis, increased metaplasia, a smaller pancreas to body weight, as shown here, um, uh, and a markedly reduced survival with overall 40% mortality. The pancreas, as you can see, just simply did not regenerate and instead of this really skinny, small uh, pancreas. And thus, you know, we did conclude that in the setting of inflammatory injury, DCLK cells are essential for pancreatic uh, regeneration. Now, the other interesting thing about these cells is that they are able to harbor mutations for a long time. And so, so since they're normally quiescent, so we examined the question of whether it could act as a, essentially a sort of a dormant cancer stem cell activated at later time points by inflammatory injury. So we induced the KRAS mutation and also uh, GFP expression is, is shown here, and then waited either two weeks or um, six months before inducing pancreatitis with our usual cerulean two-day regimen. Now at six months after um, tamoxifen induction of the KRAS mutation, actually what we found was that the number of GFP positive cells actually remained fairly constant and most had uh, failed to expand. However, when we treated the mice with cerulean and thus induced pancreatitis, these KRAS mutant DCLK progenitors were able to give rise to panins within two months. This is a shot of two months post-cerulean with these um, multiple panins shown here in green. Um, and really looked identical regardless, as you can see below here, whether you gave the cerulean either immediately, two weeks afterwards or six months later. In fact, it seemed uh, almost a little, here a little bit worse, but they were prox about the same in terms of pan and area, uh, regardless of when you induce them. So this does show that these DCLK cells can remain dormant and harbor this KRAS mutation for uh, prolonged periods of time. So um, just I'll summarize the study from our published studies uh, before getting on lastly to our unpublished studies. And so the data from our published studies suggest that DCLK uh, marks a subset of astronaut cells that are quiescent, maybe facultative pancreatic progenitors. Um, they're quiet usually, but in the setting of an inflammatory injury, can have the ability to um, expand and lineage trace during regeneration. And with oncogenic KRAS mutations, in the setting of inflammatory injury, can give rise to panins or pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, as shown in these two set of cartoons, regeneration and tumor genesis. And uh, in this regard, we think in our view that in the setting of inflammation, they're, they're distinct from most other pancreatic acid cells in their, in their responses. So I'd just like to mention that um, uh, the notion of a facultative um, acid progenitor that can contribute to regeneration and cancer was supported to some extent by this publication from the Artandi lab at Stanford, which identified also a rare population that was marked by expression of telomerase reverse transcriptase, or TERT. And they showed that similar to DCLK cells, TERT high cells um, contribute in a very limited way to normal pancreatic homeostasis, as shown here in these slides, with just a slight increase in clone size, 
over six to 12 months, um, but much greater lineage tracing following cerulean dependent pancreatitis is shown here. Again, a similar sort of expansion. And uh, in the setting of KRAS mutations, they developed um, really minimal uh, panins without cerulean, but again, um, advanced panins with cerulean. And so it appears that TERP may identify a similar population of facultative acid progenitors that could potentially overlap perhaps with DCLK1 mark cells. So to understand better the role of these DCLK cells, we generated a new um, back transgenic reporter line, uh, DCLK DTRZ screen. Um, and these, um, as you can see here in these little images, uh, these green cells uh, showed um, expression in ducts, um, acinar cells, as well as in pancreatic islets. Um, in all three types. But in contrast to our DCLK Crete ERT line, this line showed greater expression in ductular cells, as shown here in this little bar graph, um, compared to acinar cells. And this actually correlated better with DCLK protein expression than did the other line. And overall, as shown here in these FACS studies, it was expressed in about 0.3% of pancreatic epithelial EPCAM positive cells. And gene expression analysis, again, confirmed that it there was expression in, in by bulk seek of these sorted cells of uh, ductular markers, K19, islet markers, insulin, acinar markers such as amylase, um, correlating with our um, histologic findings. Now, the um, DCLK um, acinar and islet cells actually express nestin, um, a progenitor marker, while the ductular cells express acetylated tubulin. And finally, despite the um, slight different distribution in cell type, we confirmed that these DCLK cells for the pancreas when we isolated them, it showed enhanced sphere forming ability. Um, with, with, and DSG actually became enriched during um, spurred culture, um, suggesting again that it marks uh, a type of progenitor cell potentially. Now we undertook um, single cell RNA seq analysis studies to gain more insight into the cell types labeled by DCLK in the normal pancreas. Sometimes you can be fooled a bit by the immunofluorescence analysis um, or staining. And so we performed this set of droplet-based single cell RNA-seq analysis of sorted EPCAM positive ZS green uh, positive cells, and then performed unsupervised clustering using UMAP, um, which partitioned the cells really into four different clusters, each with a distinct uh, molecular profile as shown here. And of the four biggest clusters, um, cluster zero as shown here really marked um, what we didn't really appreciate as well, uh, immune and stromal cells as shown here. Um, cluster one, was the ductular um, expressing uh, cluster uh, that expressed uh, um, K19 and tough cell markers. Um, cluster two was the islet cell cluster, which expressed, um, of course, insulin. And cluster three was the cluster that expressed uh, chymotrypsin like elastase 1, CELA 1. Um, interestingly, the cluster three, which is the astro cluster, by further bioinformatic analysis, um, showed the highest entropy and calculated stem cell index, I guess, consistent with our findings from our uh, lineage tracing with the uh, Cree ERT line. Um, to study further the changes then that occur in these DCLK cells with KRAS mutation, we crossed the DCLK ZS green mice with two different KRAS models of pancreatic neoplasia, MIST1 KRAS mice or KPC mice, um, and then examined the effects on uh, the DCLK positive ZS green positive cells. Um, first, by immunofluorescence is shown here, we found a marked expansion of DCLK cells in early panins, and mostly panins one and two lesions in these mis one KRAS mice. But in, and overall, then we compared by um, flow cytometry the numbers of cells in the mis one KRAS mice, which were all um, panin uh, lesions, and uh, compared to KPC mice, uh, which at advanced stage had a significant amount of pancreatic cancer. And interestingly, even though in the case in the uh, Panin model, the MIS1 KRAS, there was a four to five fold increase in DCLK cells. This was actually decreased as the mice progressed to pancreatic cancer in the KPC mice. Um, but even in the KPC mice, the ZS green high cells were primarily in the Panin lesions, not in the pancreatic cancer lesions. And they appeared to be tough like cells um, that were um, expressed DCLK as well as multiple other tough cell markers, such as COX2, TRP. PM5, um, IL-33. Um, and so in concluding from this study here, we found uh, that these 
a, a, a DCLK cells tended to decline during progression to pancreatic cancer, thus raising questions as to whether they are actually pro-tumorigenic or anti-tumorigenic. And I'll come back uh, at the end of that question. But we then, we then carried out a, a more detailed um, single cell RNA-seq analysis of sorted DCLK ZS green cells from the MIST-1 KRAS mice. And we also crossed in TD tomato in order to be able to determine which of the ones actually had um, KRAS. So we had um, DCLK QERT, uh, KRAS, TD tomato cells, along with DCLK ZS green. And um, we uh, performed droplet-based uh, single cell RNA-seq on uh, 3,000 cells and sorted them and then performed cluster analysis using UMAP as I've described before. Um, and we also included um, normal cells in this analysis that are shown in pink, um, cells from a KRAS mice that were induced two weeks previously, and they're shown in green, and then KRAS activation at 16 weeks, which are shown in brown. And I would suggest that we ignore the gray and black uh, clusters, which are the ones that did not have TD tomato and or did not have KRAS. So this really left a, a smaller number of clusters to focus on. And we did cluster analysis initially by gene, simple gene expression, but then did it based on an algorithm called Viper, uh, which uses a master regulator approach to infer gene expression and also infer protein activity. And we found to be a little bit more accurate. Um, the cluster solutions with Viper showed a higher silhouette score of greater than 0.25, while the gene expression cluster scores uh, were um, uh, less than 0.25 and not, not quite as good. So as you can see in response to KRAS mutation, um, assuming it starts from the ASNR population shown here in pink, in this little circle here on the left, um, it goes first to the KRAS two-week time point shown here in green, and this was actually identified as cluster zero here in the middle, and then it goes to clusters one and two, um, shown here circled in the middle uh, under KRAS under 16 weeks, and there are two major KRAS clusters at 16 weeks, it's cluster one, um, which was uh, shown to be the ADM KRAS cluster, which was actually high in KRAS activity, but low in DCLK activity. And then cluster two, which was a tough cell cluster, which was high in DCLK expression, but very low in KRAS activity. So these were the two main clusters that we found, although there was also cells shown here in cluster zero from 16 weeks, which remained uh, closer to the original um, uh, progenitor uh, cell population. Um, so the um, cells that were uh, CS screen at 16 weeks, and I described these sort of two sets of clusters, were actually quite heterogeneous, as I mentioned. Some were uh, uh, DCLK high and some were DCLK low based on uh, inferred gene expression. But they were clearly derived from the ASNR cells as shown by simultaneous MIST-1 lineage tracing as shown here by immunofluorescence. You can see the green and the red overlap uh, predominantly. So these uh, DCLK cells were generated from the MIST-1 ASNR cells. But when we carried out a sorting, as shown here, we could identify the ZS green low population. Um, and so we sorted them separately and examined gene expression. We confirmed that the um, uh, ZS high cells were highly expressing um, tough cell markers, such as TRPM5, while the ZS low were not. But the ZS low cells were very high for uh, cancer stem cell markers, such as CD44 and CD133, in contrast to the ZS high markers. And it was the ZS low cells that actually formed these organoids, as we showed by separate um, uh, culturing um, in 3D matrix gel of the ZS low and ZS high. And you can see that the ZS low cells were then able to give rise to ZS high cells, as shown here by immunofluorescence. So this really establishes the ZS low cells as the progenitor population. And then we carried out additional bioinformatic algorithms and analysis, uh, including particularly a trajectory analysis. We could show that these um, KRAS cells this progenitor population at time two weeks or even time zero could give rise to two different branches, the ZS, the DCLK high KRAS low cells, which is the tough like lineage, or the KRAS high DCLK low lineage, which was the ADM like lineage. And the gene expression of the master regulators were, were quite different between these two populations. And we also were able to establish that in looking at hallmarks of cancer uh, gene expression um, uh, profiles, that the um, uh, cells at two weeks really start off with this um, very high EMT profile. And this uh, shown here in, in this gray bar is the two-week KRAS uh, mice. And then as we go to 16 weeks, um, the KRAS um, uh, high DCLK low population is shown here sort of in white. 
is very high in MYC targets and TNF-alpha and have kappa B targets, but the tough cell targets uh, is shown in red were really absent um, all sort of the hallmarks of cancer. Again, consistent with the idea that this was not a, a cancer uh, promoting uh, lineage. And so to sort of summarize our model and um, just to mention um, some of the other data I haven't had time to show you, um, using a combination of lineage tracing and single cell RNA-seq studies suggests that astronaut cells are heterogeneous. And there is a subset of sort of facultative quiescent astronaut cells that can express low levels of DCLK. And these low, uh, DCLK low cells can give rise to um, DCLK high cells, tough cells, as well as ADM in the setting of KRAS uh, mutation and inflammation. But the transition to tough cells is promoted by, indeed I don't have time to show, IL-13 expressing innate lymphoid cells, ILC2. So it's actually this transition to tough cells is promoted by IL-13 from innate lymphoid cells that upregulates this transcription factor SP1B that we've shown is critical. And that these um, tough like cells then generate a, uh, a protein angiotensinogen that actually plays a role in suppressing uh, calves and providing tumor protection. And we've actually shown this now by using inhibition of angiotensinogen using the drug Elescrine um, that results in more faster uh, uh, cancer promotion. So overall, our data support this idea that tough cells suppress tumor genesis. Um, and this was published in a recent paper by Catherine Del Giorno in Gastroenterology a couple of years ago. Um, and this explains to some extent why tough cells are, are lost during uh, final cancer progression. And I'll just mention that these uh, DCLK cells have been linked in the study by um, Andrea Viali's laboratory that published this paper on epi epithelial memory. And we were sort of minor contributors to a study. And our, our major sort of contribution was the fact that um, these DCLK cells are our primary source of steroids and in transplantation studies, we're able to regenerate normal pancreas after cerulean. And the ATAC-6 studies um, really suggested that um, cerulean led to the increased chromatin accessibility at thousands of genomic regions in this sort of regenerative population. And so to summarize then in terms of our working model, I'll just mention there's some work we haven't had time to really um, present to you, which is on another population, um, these transit amplifying astronaut progenitors that are marked by a gene trefoil factor two, which uh, is expressed in about 2% of, of the um, pancreatic epithelial cells. And these TFF2 transit amplifying cells are more important in a normal homeostasis with greater um, short-term clonal expansion, greater lineage tracing over six months, but they're lost almost uh, completely um, by cerulean pancreatitis. Um, and in fact, our data suggests that this loss of this population is in part what activates the quiescent facultative progenitors. So the TFF2 cells, um, when they're lost, this triggers the expansion of DCLK facultative progenitors, which then give rise to panins and replace the TFF2 cells. And the TFF2 cells, can, if they survive, they can survive after KRAS mutation, which allows them to give rise to panins and pancreatic cancer. And so our model then is of these two, these two progenitors one more slowly dividing, one more actively dividing, uh, combining to maintain homeostasis and regeneration. And so um, I'll, this is my final slide. I'll stop here. Um, and I'd just like to, to thank my um, um, uh, coworkers and members of my laboratory um, and my various um, funding supporters. So uh, sorry to go a few minutes over, but uh, thank you very much for, for your attention. Um, happy to take questions and what we can discuss. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wang. That was very uh, informative. Um, happy to have you. Very cool. Uh, there was only one question in the chat, as it were. Um, this was from Barry Rothenberg, and it was very early in the talk, um, asking about physio physiocytic conditions for the in vitro protocols. Um, for the in vitro protocols, I guess. Um... Would this, this be sort of the organoid uh, cultures, uh, perhaps? Um, yeah, I, I, we'd have to talk offline. Um, many of the protocols that we've um, have published in terms of, um, and they're fairly standard in terms of pancreatic organoids and other sort of cell culture models. Um, but ha happy to talk, but I, I, I guess I'd need a few more details as to what they're referring to. Thank you. Great. Uh, I think Michael was next, Michael Karen. You're muted, so you know. 
Here we go. Okay, fantastic talk, team. Uh, you, you raised so many interesting points that it's hard to follow all of them. But uh, regarding the vagal stimulation or the mascarinic uh, stimulation, as you probably know, uh, Kevin Tracy has shown that uh, vagal stimulators can actually protect from septic shock uh, quite a while ago. So it, it, there's a really a precedent for vagal stimulation inhibiting inflammation. So my question is, do you also see less fibrosis, less stellate cell activation when you use the mascarinic agonist? Yeah. Um... You mean in a cerulean model? In a yeah, in a yeah, yeah, model? maybe yeah. Maybe just in a pancreatitis model. Yeah, we we I don't think we've actually published that. We have done that. Uh, we we published on the KPC model and um and right after the vigotomy and the cerulean model. Yes, we do see less fibrosis. We actually haven't scored that. Um. Uh, and in terms of mechanism, we we haven't looked into that. We have <laughs> we haven't looked into the cellulite cells. You know, we, I think we did show that there were lower TNF alpha levels, and that's what Kevin has published. And I, I followed all his work. I, you know, we've co authored a couple of papers in other areas. You know, he's in the New York area, and I followed his work very closely. Yeah, one of, one of the things we wanted to do was to, you know, he's pursuing all these electrical vagal simulated devices, and I wanted to use them in pancreatic cancer, but haven't been able to get started. But I think, you know, the effect on, although I focused on the effect on epithelial cells, I do think the effect on inflammation. Uh, may be very significant in terms of the cancer preventing effect. Um, and whether this is just the spleen as he and I have sort of shown in various models or, or more broadly, I don't know. Um, but in terms of your question, yeah, we really should look at the stellate cells in the pancreas and their activation we haven't. Um, and that's sort of a, a, a key, key angle that we could certainly pursue. Yeah, maybe it affects the inflammatory calves, which are really the bad guys. So. Yeah, and, and in other models, as I was speaking to somebody else, um, we've shown that there are, in fact, nerve fibroblastic interactions that we haven't yet been able to pursue in, in the pancreas. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great question. I think Joan Brown has a question. Joan, you're muted. Yeah, so actually, my question was the same as Michael's question, um, whether you looked at inflammation, but although that model is a really, turns out to be really complicated one and I think it kind of centers on stuff that's going on in the in the spleen um, and I know you saw those changes in, in TNF alpha so um, so I guess you know in part it's you know how much it's really direct or indirect but then you've definitely shown these direct cholinergic effects so the question there just in terms of muscarinic receptor signaling is you know PI3 kinase and ERK and those things are pretty generic pretty much everything will do them one way or the other so I wondered if you've looked at anything like you know um, Rho activation, or Silvio might ask, YAP activation, you know, which happens in, uh, through the, can happen through that receptor. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. That no, we haven't looked at Rho A, and we've been working on Rho A with um, Channing Dura in North Carolina in stomach cancer, but we haven't looked at it in pancreatic cancer. And YAP, you know, we've looked at YAP in, in both stomach and, and, um, and colon cancer, and I know the literature in pancreatic cancer, we haven't looked at that. I, I Pretty convinced the app would be uh, upregulated, uh, but I don't know the we don't know the effects yeah. of the most critical yeah. receptors. I mean, it, it could be activated through that M1 receptor, depending on what exchange factors are there. So yeah. it might be interesting, and it can be, you know, yeah. Inflammatory. Great suggestions. Inflammatory. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. Nice to see you again. Um, I think Silvio is next. So wonderful presentation. It was really good. So and. and the wealth of animal models. So many of them, we I'm still digesting. So, but anyway, so you use cerulean um, for uh, for inducing inflammation and in initiating cancer in, in some of your models. So that also works on GPCR. Is that correct? This is so, correct. Yeah. So which cells express the GPCR? So. Yeah. Yeah. So so um, we, so one of the things that I, I haven't had a chance to talk about. I started a project, but then. As you know, that postdoc left, and that makes it very convenient to finish it. But is is actually we've been very interested in, in how surrealin works. And I don't know if you saw a recent uh, paper in Cell that this gives away all my ideas, but focused on obesity and pancreatic cancer. 
And they pointed out how in obesity and high fat diets, CCKA is upregulated in islands and acts through CCK receptors to actually um, promote the pancreatic cancer development. And so we've actually been looking, because we know we have CCK2R, pre-R2 lineage tracing. I'm lineage tracing of progenitors that express CCK2R, and it is, um, there are some islet cells, but it's mostly the acinar cells that express the CCK2R receptor, in mice, not so much CCKA, uh, a, a receptor or one receptor. And so we think that in part, cerulean promotes pancreatic cancer by stimulating the G protein coupled receptor on acinar cells. And it's not just inflammation and oxidative stress, although ROS is clearly very, very important in the epigenetic reprogramming, but I think there is some role in the cerulean model in stimulation of the CCK2 receptor. And so I'm hoping at some point to finish that, <laughs> that project, but but it's a great question, and it's, it's one I've wondered about. Most people just think cerulean inflammation and, and leave it at that, but really cerulean is frog cholecystokinin, and it binds to both the, the A or the one and the two receptors. Thank you so much. Okay, the last question um, is from Paul Insel. Um, would you prefer if I read the question or um, would you like to- uh, No, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I, I, so I'm on, I, I can answer. Okay. Um, no, I want to come back to the, the neural question a little bit related to what um, Michael and Joan asked, but I'm curious if you think that the ASNR cells and or in fact the PDAC cells in the duct, they, they themselves may produce catecholamines or uh, acetylcholine, for example. There's data in the literature going back many years that the renal, cell, renal tubular cells can, can do that. You think everything comes from the nerves and in or, or could it be that there's some other cells that are producing local uh, amines or, or acetylcholine that could be regulating? And the second part of that I wanted to ask is, is there a clinical trial going on with beta blockers for PDAC? Um, that would seem like a, something that ought to be tried. Yeah, yeah, uh, great, great question. So the first thing is, is on a production of acetylcholine, which is mainly mediated by the enzyme that we can stand for called CHAT. Um, right, right. Acetyltransferase, cholinergic acetyltransferase, uh, choline acetyltransferase. And um, we have seen that CHAT gets upregulated in, in cancer. I don't think it's high, we haven't seen it highly expressed in the normal pancreas. And sort of my own view is, and this is true of a lot of sort of cancer mechanisms, is that perhaps there's some initiating early signal that's more neural dependent, but that um, later on, um, uh, you know, other cells can produce CHAT. Now, my, my thinking is that. CHAT is um, suppressive in pancreatic cancer, so I don't think it would be upregulated. I haven't seen it upregulated in pancreatic cancer, but I have seen it upregulated, for example, in, in colon and gastric cancer, and that's sort of the model there is that maybe it's auto-stimulatory later on in, in, in development. But I think you're right. I think um, just assuming that all CHAT or, or all catecholamines are just from the normal nerves is probably a mistake. And um, you know, uh, that we need to look at that a little bit more carefully. The other expression of chat that, and this is what we've also published on with, um, and Kevin Tracy has, is chat is expressed by memory T cells. And so just for those of you who are interested in, in inflammation, you know, the key uh, sort of cell in the, in the spleen is this CD44, CD44 positive memory T cell that actually communicates directly to uh, myeloid cells and macrophages by, by chat. Um, and so that's an interesting sort of model as well. Your other question was on beta blockers. Um, I think there are some uh, beta blocker trials, um, and we've talked about this um, in uh, at MD Anderson, but not in pancreatic cancer. Um, there's been some interest in pursuing this in Australia, um, beta blocker trials in pancreatic cancer. But I, you know, the problem with beta blockers is, um, you know, the the non-specific beta blockers such as uh, propanolol um, are sort of generic, and there's no drug company <laughs> that has wanted to sponsor them. So it would have to be some sort of um, NCI or foundation-sponsored trial to do that. I've advocated for that, and but so far I haven't been able to get funding. Yeah, maybe we should talk about that. Okay, thank you. Maybe San Diego can carry it out. That would be great. <laughs> thank you. Also, not to interject uh, interject too much because a question in the chat, but I also remember from reading the paper you guys did a retrospective study uh, looking at the effects of beta blockers on PDAC and saw that everything was more specifically improved improved condition-wise by beta-2 blocker specifically, right? No, so, uh, so I guess, thank you for remembering in, in our paper, we, we it was a retrospective study. Um, I think it was in Germany that compared um, patients that underwent, I think, uh, surgery Whipple operation, and then were either on um, 
uh, a non-specific beta blocker that uh, indorol or propanolol that would block one and two, or a specific beta blocker, which is more commonly used now in most cardiology and other diseases, a, a beta one specific blocker. And so the ones um, there are, that we're taking a beta two specific blocker tend to do survive longer, um, and, but not the ones that were on a tenolol or a beta one specific blocker. So, so that was supportive, but again, it's a retrospective, and so we really at some point it'd be nice to do a prospective trial. So yeah. The next question is from Jonathan Weiss. Hi, yeah, uh, great to meet you. It was a fantastic talk and, and really enjoyed. Um, so you saw some effects manipulating the vagus uh, nerve and uh, we've seen ourselves that sensory nerves from the pancreas are communicating via the vagus by serotonin and at least in the islet. But the pancreas is also innervated by enteric nerves. And so do you have an idea where these nerves are coming from and which ones you think are most common during PDAC, either sympathetic or cholinergic or what kind of nerves these these are? Yeah, I know that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, so, I, you know, the pancreas by all three types of nerves, um, the vagus nerve, uh, the, the sympathetic nerves from um, uh, mesenteric ganglia and um, uh, sensory nerves, which come from the vagus and a few other locations. And it, it is believed that the, uh, at least in the normal pancreas, and I don't know if it's been certainly not characterized well in the human pancreatic cancer models. There's been some retrograde chasing um, by some in, in pancreatic cancer models. Um, I mean, the majority are sensory nerves and the others are uh, less common. Now, we've tried to do some retrograde chasing. I mean, we do find some enteric nerves coming from the duodenum, for example, um, that, we, that we can trace back and we've done that. Um, but, you know, the, the problem is that there's a lot, there's a lot of nerves. Um, vagus nerve has, as Kevin Tracy tells me, over a thousand fibers and we don't know what most of them are. So this is a very challenging area. And so um, more needs to be done. And also in terms of how it's, it's remodeled um, during pancreatic cancer. Lately, um, there's a technique that um, people who've actually been looking at innervation here in the very center in, in terms of the islets uh, of doing this, a, a better set of analysis using this, and you probably know it, this a tissue clearing method where you remove everything and leave the nerves. And you can get a really a better look at this. And so we've started to pursue this a little bit in some of our model systems, but uh, sorry, I don't have more details to tell you, but this, this is a great question and something that we and others really need to look at in more detail. Thank you very much. Okay, we might have time for one more question. And I think Hannah Petit had one. Um, so Hannah, would you like to speak to that or would you like me to read it out? I believe they are signing on right now. Oh, um, sorry, yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, so I was wondering if the role of DLCK1 has been sh um, shown at all in asthma cell carcinoma. Hmm. Um, yeah, um, so that's a, that's a very good question. So I'd say in human acid carcinoma, uh, it hasn't been investigated at all. And I'm trying to think as to whether there's any um, good mouse models of acid or cell carcinoma. Um, to be honest, I, I haven't heard of it and come across it. So I, uh, if you know of a model system, I'd be happy to sort of try to try to look at it. But I don't know of a good model of acid or cell carcinoma. And I guess most people have tried to focus on Dutchler carcinoma, just because it's more prevalent. Um, do you know of any aster cell models of carcinoma um, in mice? Or I know other? that like my lab has also been like struggling. It's not like a great model for APC. Um, so I don't know any off the top of my head. Okay, good. Well, if you, you hear of any, I'm happy to try to, to look at that. <laughs> thank you so thank much. You. <laughs> okay, thank you so much everyone for coming. Um, really wonderful seminar yeah. and um, obviously, uh, if you have more questions, I'm sure Dr. Wang would be happy to answer them via email or another time. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>